Thank, thanks very much, and, and thanks very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, I think that uh, solutions of the climate problem are, and, and solutions uh, for our children's future are really going to depend upon uh, workers understanding the situation. Um, and so I'm very glad to, um, to interact with you. Um, the, the situation is that we have a gap between what is understood about global warming by the relevant scientific community and what's known by the people who need to know, and that's the public. The, the truth is that we have a planetary emergency, and this is not obvious to the public because weather fluctuations are much larger than global average uh, climate change. Uh, but the reason that we can have a problem is the inertia of the climate system. It does not respond quickly as you begin to apply forces to it. Because the ocean is four kilometers deep, the ice sheets are three kilometers thick. Um, so when we add gases like carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which are like a blanket, they reduce the Earth's heat radiation to space. And so they cause a temporary energy imbalance where you've got more energy coming in from the sun than heat going out. And that causes uh, the planet to warm up, but it takes time because of this great inertia. So we've only experienced about half of the warming due to the gases that are already in the atmosphere. The rest is still in the pipeline. And the danger is that we can pass tipping points in which the dynamics of the system begins to take over, and you get changes that are out of our control. Uh, the bad news is that it's become clear from the science that we're already in a dangerous level of atmospheric carbon dioxide. But the good news is that it's still possible to deal with this problem, and there would be multiple benefits of doing that. Just to mention a couple of tipping points, Ice sheet disintegration is a good example. It, it, the main process is the ocean gets warmer. That causes the ice shelves, the tongues of ice from the ice sheets that come out into the ocean, to melt. And that causes the ice streams from the ice sheets to, to surge and deliver icebergs to the ocean more rapidly. And you can get to a point where the disintegration of the ice sheet becomes a dynamic process that's out of your control. The same thing is true with uh, species. If we drive a number of them to extinction, because of the interdependencies of species, you can have uh, uh, ecosystems begin to collapse, and you, then you lose many uh, species. One tipping point that is already well underway is the Arctic sea ice. Uh, the one chart shows the, the where the, the sea ice this last uh, summer, the amount remaining at the end of the summer is only 51% of what it was 30 years ago because the Arctic is getting warmer and the sea ice is melting. It's also thinner ice that's remaining. It's only about half as thick as it was uh, 30 years ago. So the volume of ice has been reduced by 75%. And we're going to lose that ice at the end of the melt season, at the end of the summer, within the next few decades, conceivably within a decade. But that's a tipping point which is reversible. If the planet cools off, the, the sea ice reforms in the winter. And so if the planet cools off a bit, then the ice will get a little thicker and will go back in the other direction. Uh, but. Uh, we can say that we are going to lose it all because the, the planet is continuing to get warmer. Uh, it, temperature fluctuates. Even you average over the whole planet and over the whole year, it fluctuates a lot from year to year because it's a chaotic system. But over, you average over a decade, and you can see that over the last 30 years, it's been almost a monotonic increase of global temperature. And we know that it's going to keep increasing because the planet is out of energy balance. We've finally been able to measure that very precisely, because where does the excess energy go? Most of it has to go into the ocean. The nations of the world distributed more than 3,000 Argo floats around the world's ocean. 
They dive down into the ocean to a two kilometer depth, measuring the temperature and some other quantities, and then they come back to the surface and they radio the information to a satellite. And what uh, it shows is that the amount of heat in the ocean is increasing. It's increasing at a rate of about six-tenths of a watt per meter squared averaged over the planet. And what that means is that there's about as much warming that's in the pipeline, because the, the planet will continue to warm up until it restores energy balance. So there's about as much warming in the pipeline as that which has already occurred. And this, these measurements were made during the deepest solar minimum in the period of accurate measurements of the sun. People who like to deny the reality of climate change will say, oh, the sun is what really is changing things, and there will be natural variability. Well, these measurements were made, the, the Argo float measurements were made during a period when the sun was the dimmest that it has been in the entire period of record, and yet there was more energy coming in than going out. Um, and as a result, we know that, you know, the area that has melting on Greenland fluctuates a lot each year with the weather, but the area is increasing. And last, this uh, summer, we had even more, a bigger area with surface melt than in 2007, which was the previous record. And now, you would expect that as the planet's getting warmer, the ice sheets are probably going to be melting and getting smaller. Well, now, beginning in 2003, with the launch of the gravity satellite, which measures the gravitational field of the Earth with such a high precision that you can measure the changes in the mass of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. <clears throat> During the winter, they get heavier, and uh, in the summer, there's melting, but overall, they're losing mass. Greenland is now losing mass at about 300 cubic kilometers per year. And Antarctica is also losing mass at a somewhat slower rate. Furthermore, the, the rates of mass loss are accelerating. And as a result, sea level is going up. Uh, the rate in the last 20 years has been 3.1 millimeters a year, which is not a lot, but in a century, that's 31 centimeters. It's a little more than a foot. Uh, it, it, this is a rate of 3.1 meters per millennium, which if you compare to the last 5,000 years, the change in sea level was less than a meter. Now it's more, increased by more than a factor of 10. Their danger, though, is that the ice sheets will really begin to collapse and we'll get several meters in a year, which would obviously be disastrous. Um, and the Earth's history tells us that if we stay on this path of increasing CO2, then we will get this multimeter uh, sea level rise. But, it, but the public, if they pay attention, should begin to notice that the frequency of extreme events is changing. The, uh, this um, <coughs> bell curve is, shows the natural variability of the summer mean temperature uh, 50 years ago. So there were some summers that were colder than average and some that were warmer than average, and it formed a nice uh, bell curve. Now, because the planet is getting warmer, that bell curve is moving to the right. Each decade, it has moved further to the right. And this is, this is data. This is not a climate model. This is real observations of surface temperature on land. All, uh, in this case, it's northern hemisphere. But what it means is that you, we now have, while the extreme events of a three standard deviations, which occurred only two-tenths of one percent of the time 50 years ago, are now occurring about 10 percent of the time. Or in other words, 10 percent of the land area will have these extreme uh, summer temperature anomalies. And last summer, we had one over Texas and Oklahoma this summer, over the central Rocky Mountain regions and stretching into the Great Plains, we had a three standard deviation um, heat anomaly. And I can tell you, my relatives in Omaha and, and Iowa, uh, it was exceedingly hot this past summer. Um, and one of the effects of these extreme, uh, extremely hot summers is uh, 
increased wildfires, which burn hotter and uh, are more damaging. And the frequency and area covered by such fires is increasing. Another effect, uh, the, the extreme hot summers occur where you happen to have high pressure system that summer. But those, those kind of things are highly variable. So next year is going to be a, a different pattern. But the frequency and area covered by these extreme events is uh, increasing. And because a warmer planet, hold, the atmosphere holds more water vapor, so when you do get rain, it tends to be heavier and come in more extreme events, and you get um, more extreme floods. And where I live, we've had 300-year uh, floods in the last 20 years. Um, that, uh, you know, it's said that climate naturally has varied over a huge range. Well, that's true. If you look over the last 65 million years, the first half of that period, the planet was so warm that there was no ice on the planet, and sea level was 250 feet higher. And that, that climate change was, in fact, associated with atmospheric carbon dioxide because the amount in the atmosphere depends upon uh, continental drift, depends upon volcanoes, which put the CO2 in the atmosphere. And so it depends on what the, the, the um, continental drift is doing. And over, but over the last 50 million years, uh, the planet has been cooling off. Um, now, however, humans have taken over and we've become the determinant of atmospheric carbon dioxide. So we're going back up this curve in the other direction. The last time there was more than 500 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, the planet uh, was nearly ice free. What this tells us is that we can't burn all the fossil fuels without putting the planet on a path back to the ice-free state. It would take time because of this inertia of the oceans and the ice sheets, but you would start a process which then becomes out of your control. We've only burned a small fraction of the uh, fossil fuels. Uh, but we can't burn all of them. And yet the governments are going right ahead and encouraging going after every fossil fuel that they can find. Um, mountaintop removal, tar sands, tar shale, drilling in the Arctic. That's, uh, unfortunately, we can't do that if we want to be uh, fair to our children. Uh, the problem is that fossil fuels are the cheapest energy. They're not really the cheapest energy because we're subsidizing them, but in addition, we don't make them pay for the damages that they do to human health, and we don't make them pay for the climate effects. The costs are passed on to our children. Um, the solution, therefore, needs to be a rising price on carbon. So I argue that what you have to do is put a fee on carbon that you collect at the source, at the domestic mine or the port of entry. And you give the money 100% to the public on a per capita basis to legal residents of the country, not one dime to the government. And the merit of this is that it's transparent, it's market-based, and it will stimulate innovation. Uh, it will leave energy decisions to the individuals. So it is a conservative plan uh, for energy and climate. Uh, so it's, um, you know, this climate system has nonlinear feedbacks, with, but there are also nonlinear feedbacks that would occur if we put a gradually rising price on carbon because you would reach tipping points where alternatives become cheaper than the fossil fuel, and then you get a rapid uh, movement uh, toward replacing the fossil fuel. And with this rising price on carbon, it, it spurs innovation and investment. Uh, we should not be specifying what the technology winners are, but if we put a price on carbon, then that's going to in allow advanced generation nuclear power to compete uh, with fossil fuels and energy efficiency and um, renewable energies. Uh, 
that that's what and the jobs that would be associated with these technologies would be good jobs um, and if if you the country that does this and is gets out ahead will be the one that benefits the most um, and uh, I think we need to um, we need to get the public to understand this, including the workers. You know, I uh, found that uh, it's hard to communicate with with people if they feel their job is threatened. But they need to take a broad a, a broad look at this issue and understand that, on the long run, uh, the the workers will will get much better opportunities if we are leaders and taking advantage of the potential that we have to move uh, toward uh, improved clean energy technologies. Uh, one of the organizations that I'm working with, Citizens Climate Lobby, um, is, is trying to uh, help educate the public and lawmakers by visiting lawmakers and by writing op-eds and letters to the editor of newspapers. I think they're potentially um, an effective organization which is growing very rapidly. But we need to have cooperation. We need to have understanding between uh, labor organizations and uh, environmental organizations and people who are concerned about the future of, uh, of their children. Thanks.